I know you have options. Thanks for coming. This is fun. It's called What We Don't Know. Uh, that's my name, Chris Coyer. I'm at Chris Coyer on various social networks. That's my personal website. I live out in Palo Alto, California. That's me in 1989 getting a power pad for Christmas in stonewashed jeans and Reebok high tops. I'm here with a, this squishy. Why is it, can I, um, should, does it matter that much? I hate the squish. I'm here with the Bar Camp Tour, which is a bunch of brands and we're, we sponsor and stuff. I work for a company called Wufu.com about a year, which is a web form builder, maybe some of you have heard of it. About a year ago, we got bought by a company called SurveyMonkey, so I kind of work for both of those two things right now. I have a blog called CSS-Tricks.com where I talk about front-end stuff. This whole thing is going to be about front-end stuff, so if you're like uh, web stuff, so if, that, if you absolutely don't care about that stuff, definitely a better place to be. I wrote a book about WordPress called the blog for that is digwp.com, and I have a podcast where I talk about front-end stuff called Shop Talk Show. So that's the pillars of me. So this is what we don't know about the web. I want to give us a little framework that's going to kind of tie the whole talk together, and that's going to be the anatomy of a single web request, an uh, incredibly oversimplified one. There's probably smarter people in here that, could, that are, would tell me that this is way more complicated and I'm sure that it is. But here are the players involved in one web request, right? There's a server, and on that server has, you know, it's like a computer basically, and then we put our website resources on it. There's a browser of some kind, and there's a dude. Dude uses his browser. Browser, Trevor, that arrow is the internet, that little one. It goes to the server. The server's like, cool, got it. Sends it back to the browser. The browser displays the stuff that it got back from the server, and the dude consumes it. That is what a web request is like. If we were to think about this transaction as a medieval fantasy map, which of course we will, <laughs> everything to the left of the of river serve browser dude is like known territory. We know the server because we bought it and we run it. We know what the software is on it. We put those resources there. We know that. This is known territory. So it's mapped in our medieval fantasy map. Everything east over here, we don't know about. We don't know who dude is. We know nothing about him. We don't know how he interacts with his browser. We don't know how that browser is able to communicate with the server. This is unknown territory. And medieval fantasy maps, when there's like unknown territory where they don't, they don't like know what's there, they just assume that dragons are there. <laughs> Which is fine. They put their... That's safe, because you don't know. You might as well assume the worst. We're going to assume the worst, too. We don't know any of that stuff, so we need to accommodate for that. So we're not talking about the unknowns in this talk. We're going to focus on, or the knowns. We're going to focus on all the unknowns, and we're going to do it in four parts. We're going to talk about how the browser, the network that connects to it. We're going to talk about the browser. We're going to talk about how Dude interacts with the browser, and we're going to talk about Dude himself. So four parts. I know the most about number two. I have the most to say about number two, so we're going to do them out of order, and we're going to spend most of the time on the unknown browser. So just to put a point on it, we don't know what browser our visitor is using at that time of a single web request. We just kind of have no idea. If it's a desktop browser, it's probably one of these you're all familiar with, one of the big players in it. It could be any one of these versions. It could be back to old Safari. Safari even has the differences between Safari Oh, and 5.2 are pretty significant, so that kind of matters. Old school IE that we like to make fun of, and new school IE, which we're going to stop making fun of because it's awesome. Uh, Firefox is in 11 now. Firefox and Chrome are in like six-week dev cycles, so things are scooting along really fast now. Uh, we're kind of, it's pretty obvious to us, though, as front-end people, right, that those, the, the different versions of these browsers and the different browsers themselves handle things differently, right? There's, there's cross-browser problems. They just support different things. So what do we, what do, we do about that? Because we're just admitting that we don't know. We want to accommodate everybody, and we don't know what browser it is. So one of the possible strategies we can do, because these browsers are different, is nothing. That's one thing we could do. <laughs> so there's a website by, I think Dan Cederholm made this like years and years ago, but it's a real website you can visit. Do websites need to look the same in every browser? And there's just a big no right there. So he's just saying, no, they don't. They don't need to look the same. Here's a redesign of Wufu.com that went out recently, and this is, looks like Firefox 10 or 11 or whatever. This is how it looks in that, and this is how it looks uh, in IE7. Clearly there's some differences, right? We lost, or the, the rounded corner on the search input is gone here. Everything is square corners instead of rounded corners. There was, there was icons before up here, which were probably 
pseudo element. For some reason, they didn't work great in IE7, so you got rid of that. The dinosaur is gone. He was probably a pseudo element. He's gone. But, but, but this is fine, right? It's, tr it's almost trivially different than this, right? And, and, and so some IE7 work into this. Kevin is, is here. He's the designer on this, and I just talked to him about it. He said, like, oh, we, before we launched, I was like, oh, I just sat down and spent, like, a couple, couple hours in IE, and now it works fine. You know, it's largely the MET approach to, to cross browser testing. Yeah, it looks different, but whatever. It's fine. It works fine, right? Uh, so to, to, part of this unknown browser thing is CSS3, right? Some browsers support different parts of it and in different ways or whatever. If you want to test what your website looks like without any CSS3 on it at all, uh, this is a little bookmark. Just Google the, the CSS3, drag it up to your bookmarks bar, and any website you're on, just click it. It's basically super IE8 preview mode, which supports no CSS3. It's just a quick little tool if you don't want to fire up a VM or you don't have any fancy uh, testing tools. Just a, kind of a quick tester there. I'm going to be just scattering little tools at you because I feel like those are kind of good takeaways. Here's CSSTricks.com in super IE8 preview mode. It just looks like that. Fine. I don't care. Good enough for me. Lost some shadows, lost some rounded corners, uh, that kind of thing. The frog's a little screwed up. I should probably do a little better job here and there, but for the most part, meh. <laughs> a step up from meh is these things, progressive enhancement and graceful degradation. I saw a blog post the other day that was like, things you should ask front-end web developers during an interview or something, and then one of the questions is like, explain the difference between graceful degradation and progressive enhancement, and then in the answer key it was like, bonus points if they say, nobody can. Because it's like, it's just, they're, they're so similar that it's like, what's the difference? We'll try to define it though. This is a quote by Christian Heilman, who was at Opera at the time, is now at Mozilla. Starting with a baseline of usable functionality, then increasing the richness of the user experience by testing for support and then applying it. So here's an example of that. Uh, OldNavy.com, you go to OldNavy.com, you want to look search for an Old Navy by you, there's this map over here and you can write your address in there and it will go boo and show you where the ones are over there. That's a baseline of decent functionality. If you're visiting it, and this is Firefox 10, it will ask you to share your location. You click that button, it figures out where you live, and then you can click a button again, and it will show you Old Navy's by you. That's nice. So it wor And then here's Safari 4. It doesn't support geolocation. It still works fine, but they've progressively enhanced and added some geolocation stuff so it works better. You have to just do less typing. It's just a little nicer. Uh, so that's what, you know, what progressive enhancement is all about. Er, yeah, and then graceful degradation is like providing an alternative version. It's like going the other way. Like use a fancy thing, but if the fancy thing's not there, like deal with it somehow. <clears throat> An example of that is just really simple. Let's say uh, that won't work in any linear gradient needs to be like vendor prefixed or whatever. So, that, but I'm just for brevity, I just left it like that. Let's say you wrote this. You have this header block, and you put this cool gradient behind it, and make the color white in. Uh, you know, most modern browsers, you'll get this cool gradient with white text in it. In super IE8 preview mode, you get that because <laughs> it doesn't support white on white. That's no good. You can't read the text. So just a very simple version of, of fallback is just put a fallback color that IE8 will understand behind it, and then, and then you're fine. So that's just the world's simplest graceful degradation like technique or whatever uh, in CSS. This is the... Uh, the form manager in Wufu, when you log in, you're immediately taken to this screen. Wufu has a lot of JavaScript. It's a JavaScript heavy app. Even on this uh, page, there's a lot of JavaScript. You like change a theme and it does stuff and make sure that that's saved for that thing or turning on and off. Well, there's plenty of JavaScript in this page. If you get to this page and you don't have JavaScript on, it would, it would be problematic. Uh, so we just have it, if JavaScript's off, there's a no script tag, it displays an overlay and says, sorry, you could, oh, this only works with JavaScript on. You'd be like, Chris, how is that graceful degradation? It just doesn't work. Well, it is graceful. What's not graceful is it just being broken. That's not graceful. The graceful is providing links so they can understand why that's the case and how to fix that problem. And so it's just a, you know, we would deal with it in a kind of graceful way. So do websites need to look exactly the same in every browser? No. But is it ideal if websites essentially work the same in all browsers, providing essential features and don't appear totally busted? Dot com. Yes. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a fake. That doesn't exist. <laughs> I just wrote it in there. I have this podcast called Shop Talk Show. We have this audio. We wanna, you want to be able to go to the website and you want to hit play and you want to be able to listen to one of our shows if you want, if you're not like awesomely subscribed in iTunes or whatever. 
So we want to have a, a player, but we are all like, okay, of course, HTML5 has an audio element. We'll just use that, right? We're like, hmm, I wonder what the support is like. Before you make a decision like that, maybe you should think about support a little bit. You can go to caniuse.com and just type in audio or just go slash audio, and it shows you what the browser support for that feature is. And you're like, okay, let's make the reasonable thing that we're going to support browsers at least two back. Boy, there's a lot of green there. Let's go for it. So that's maybe how we, you would make a decision like that about how you're going to what you're going to support and not support. So then you're like, how do you do that again? You're like, Google, audio, syntax, HTML, or whatever. You know, that's how we all work, right? You just, I just Google everything all day. It's like my job. <laughs> the, you, and then put MDN at the end of the search, because that will get you to the Mozilla docs, which are re a really good uh, resource for that kind of thing. That's a little hot tip. You know, if you're Googling, like, syntax stuff just to avoid getting a W3Schools link, put MDN on the end of it. <laughs> And, get this. and then it'll be the, you'll get the syntax. You'll be like, oh, cool, I recorded my podcast, so I have an MP3. I threw the MP3 on the server. I linked up the sources, and yes, done. But then you go to Firefox or whatever, and it doesn't work. And you're like, bummer, I screwed up something. You know what I should do? I should go to html5please.us or .com, I think works too. And it's basically a list of all the HTML5 and CSS3 stuff and kind of evaluation whether you should use it or not or if you should be careful in using it or whatever, and then you just click on the feature and it gives you like a little bit of just plain English that explains the sitch, basically. On the, so you find audio, it says use with polyfilia. Cool, use it. As is the case of video, you need to provide your audio file in multiple formats for it to work. Ah, that's it. Okay, we screwed that up. Namely an Aug Vorbis and an AAC. Blah, 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 blah. Cool, got it. MP3, how do we get an Aug? Well, here's the resource. Go to media.io. Grab the MP3, click AUG, hit the thing, and does it, and it gives you an AUG. So you're like, cool, now I have the two formats that I need. That's cool. What the heck is an AAC? I don't even, I don't know to this day, I don't know. But you, if you can put it in iTunes and pick the AAC thing, and it will do it, and it comes out in MP3. I think it's like MP3 with bookmarky stuff in it or something, but whatever. You just need it in those two formats. Then you put the sources in there together in there, and you leave your fallback in there. So if the browser doesn't support anything at all, it will show a link to download it. And we're like, we're going to move that outside because we want the link to download it for anybody. Like, why not, right? Uh, so there it is. And then, okay, back on, back on this. It was like, also, if you want to support the red that we saw in the thing, like, we can use a polyfill. So polyfill is media element JS. So let's go to that page. Uh, and how this is how polyfills work. We're going to talk about them more just a little mini bit later, but what it does is it just, if a browser doesn't support audio, which, you know, definitely in like IE7, 8 land, it doesn't support the audio element, it will test and see if it does, and if it doesn't, it will do it some other way, in this case, Flash or Silverlight. I don't even know how this one works, but it's awesome. And polyfills are really easy. You just, you use the HTML that you would use in new modern browsers, the audio tag that we, we got working really good for us in new browsers. You link up the, the JavaScript that it gives you. You find, this is, in this case it's using jQuery, you find all audio elements on the page and just link up this custom thing. Literally, that's it. In modern browsers, it will stay the way it is and will be, you know, use the modern way to do it. And in older browsers, like IE7 here, it will replace it with a little chunk of flash that does the same thing. So now, we have this audio player working across everything. Uh, I'm going to keep putting a point on it once in a while. We don't know what browser our visitor is using. It's part of the, part of the deal here. We're trying to accommodate for that, because it could be i7, whatever it might be. You might as well give them something good. We need tools to ease the cross-browser pain. So one of the things about writing modern code, if you write a lot of CSS these days, is what about vendor prefixes? Even if a browser supports some CSS3 feature, it may support it behind a vendor prefix. So if it's gradient, it's not just linear gradient, it's dash webkit linear, linear gradient, and even then there's multiple syntaxes for it, and you should probably do both. How do you possibly remember all of that? What's the best practice these days? You can go to css3please.com. You can just be like, do -do 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 and type in the new things, and then hit clipboard, copy and paste it into your CSS phone. You have kind of the latest, greatest version. Well, it's a lot of this. <laughs> pretty cool. Uh, if you already have authored CSS, you could go to prefixer.com, paste it in there, and it will parse it and figure out the ones that you need and replace it. And bleh. So if you if <coughs> have existing CSS or whatever, or if you're super awesome, you'll use a free processing language like SAS, which I'd be happy to talk with anybody about later. I'm not going to be super drilling it hard today because I 
feel like that's annoying sometimes when people do that. But SAS is a preprocessing language that happens locally, like on your machine. So you write a SAS file, and you write it in this kind of nicer, more terse syn syntax, and then you have some kind of program running that watches when you have written that file, and it processes it into actual CSS, and that's what gets deployed to your website. It's very nice. SAS by itself doesn't help you with the vendor prefix problem, but you can write what's called a mix-in. So for the gradient, you know, you need all those different syntaxes. You would write a mixin that's called like my rad gradient, and it would take a couple functions. So functions just like you would write in JavaScript or any other programming language that take those numbers that you gave it, which are the two colors you want for your gradient, and use them in all the multiple syntaxes that it needs to spit out. Uh, I'll show you an example of that in a minute. So what? Sass. Sass. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's reasons. It's more actively developed. The less guys are kind of petering out, I feel like. Uh, there's things I like about less or whatever, but uh, uh, extend is super useful, not in, in less. Anyway, there's a, I could, there's another time. <clears throat> so if some people are like, when, you, when people say SAS, they always say SAS slash compass. What's compass? I feel like that can be confusing for some people sometimes. SAS is the language, Compass is this optional set of stuff that you can use like imports within, within it that deals with all that CSS3 stuff. So if you don't want to write your own mix-in for Gradient, which you don't, use Compass and, and use its standardized version of all this stuff so you can now write the, the Compass version of what uh, Gradient is like and Compass will deal with that and Compass stays updated for when there's a new syntax or whatever. Just, just stop dealing with prefixes. Forget it, it's no, no longer part of your authoring life. Here's the hottest tip of all. If you, sorry, there's some tools similar for, for Linux and PC, but Mac developers, this is not for them yet, or it's, it is for Mac and it's not for anything else. Spit it out, Christ Jesus. <laughs> the code kit is the number one takeaway. Well, I want everybody to ask that as a Mac and write CSS and JavaScript and HTML to download code kit because it's super, super cool and useful you have your local project folder that you're working on and authoring stuff, and you drag it onto this folder, and it will look through it, and it'll be like, oh, there's some JavaScript. Would you like it that when every time I change that file, I check it with JS hint and then con concatenate it with your other JavaScript files and minify for you and then serve that with your project? Yes, I would like that. That would be awesome if you would do that. And it, there's, oh, I see there's a SAS file in that, too. Would you like me to watch that file so that any time that it changes, I will reprocess that file for you, spit it out into a compressed format, and inject the style into the browser that you're developing in right now and show you those changes? Frick, yes, I would. That would be amazing. <laughs> and it does all that stuff, and it does even more than that. We'll talk to you. And it's, it's free right now because it's in beta, so it's totally, it will change. Change the way you work. So here's the gradient thing. You would import your custom mixins, or you would import the compass version, and then you'd say, oh, my red gradient. Pass it to two colors, and it would go boot and spit out in your, in your, the actual CSS that your browser's using, all the garbage that it needs to make a gradient. Cool. Okay, so we're looking at tools to help cross browser problems. One of the tools that we've been using since CSS was a thing because browsers do, they have different user agent style sheets that handle things a little differently. So uh, a reset is really common. They'll toss the reset in there, it'll just nuke all styling, and then you can start from this, this t even playing field across browsers. It's, that's the whole point of a reset. Uh, you grab it, you put it in your CSS, you return, 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 actual styles, and you start writing your CSS. Uh, people do it. Absolutely, I did it for a long time. I'm saying, let's get rid of that. Let's start using this. Normalize.css. It, it does both more and less than resets, kind of. It, if there's useful styles, like every user agent style sheet from IE6 to Chrome 50 or whatever has uh, headings are bold. That's part of the thing. So why get rid of that? You probably want your headings bold. Resets, like, nuke all that stuff, and then you've got to go reset it again later, and it's just kind of... Uh, wasteful, and it just it provide it, it does more. These, this is just more up to date. It's, it supports more more browsers than resets do, uh, and just kind of leaves things alone. So the the new workflow that I think you should try is grab a copy of Normalize. Don't remove anything in Normalize, but if there's something that you don't like or that you would do differently, change the values in Normalize and get yourself a nice look and start, uh, and then import that, and then write your stuff. So it's just cleaner, it's better, use normalize, hot tip. Uh, you're not resetting stuff to do it again later and you get, you get more out of a normalize. 
Uh, and it avoids this problem, which I friggin' hate with resets, where you use the web inspector and you're trying to like grab this p tag, and it's like, well, that p tag has margin zero because it's in a p, which is in an article, which is in a div, which is in the body, which is in HTML. So you just get block after block of this crap in the web inspector, and I can't deal with it anymore. No more resets. <laughs> I feel like this, you know, everybody's probably aware of this. I would say I don't want to do the hands thing because I hate when speakers do that, but. <clears throat> Most people have probably heard of this. This is a tool for testing browser comp stuff, right? Like, does this browser support box shadow or not? Modernizer will tell you true or false. Uh, it has an API for that, or it will literally put a class name on the HTML element that says CSS box shadow. That means it does support it if you've loaded the JavaScript, modernizer JavaScript, or it'll be no dash CSS box shadow if you're in a browser that doesn't. So should this be part of your toolkit on every project that you work on in the whole world? No, I don't think so. You should know what it's for. It's really useful. And I, I just want to, I just feel like people are like, I've heard of modernize, but I haven't quite worked into my workflow yet. Uh, this, is, this is when you need it, okay? I just want to just make a very clear point. You need it when you need to do that. It gives you a way to cleanly fork styles and behavior. So if you know that you need this really clean fork where you say, I want to do this in this circumstance and this in this other circumstance, that's when you need modernizer. For CSS tricks, you go, and it's just in, 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 in the removal of CSS and it still looks fine. I don't need modernizer. I don't care that it looks like that in IE8. I'm not providing some specific alternative. So I just don't need it on CSS tricks, so I don't use it there. Uh, this is, here's an example of when you would need it. Let's say you're building a web application, you have a dialog box style, and it's a big warning, so you put that red glow behind it, like, oh, warning, oh, it's got that look, you just love it. That's, that's what's going on, and then in IE8, you don't get it, because IE8 doesn't do box shadow, and it just doesn't have the same jump spot or whatever, you know, it doesn't, it's not doing it, you did some user testing, they're not getting it, that you need that red shadow. So now you're in the situation where you need to define Use the box shadow if you can, and do something else different if it doesn't support it. So you would say, well, here's my dialog box, and I'm just using the SCSS syntax here from SAS, and I'm saying, it, which has this nested thing. So it means if the HTML element has a class of box shadow on it, then put my box shadow on it. And if it doesn't, put a big old red border around it. Clean fork. Supports it, doesn't support it. That would be hard to do without some kind of detection situation. Okay, this comes with Modernizer if you want it. It's called Modernizer.load when it comes with Modernizer, but it, it's a standalone too. It's a script loader, and it loads scripts conditionally based on a true-false thing. So you're like, Modernizer.geolocation, we know it returns either true or false. True if you're in a browser that supports it, false if it doesn't. If it does, load your normal stuff. If not, load some other stuff. So it's just do a test. Load things conditionally based on the results of that test. So an example of that would be like, I want to test and see if there's date inputs, if that's supported. In HTML5, you do input type of date, and in browsers that support it, you'll get a little drop-down date picker. Pretty cool. Uh, so in that, and that's our test. If we say, if no, that doesn't work, then load jQuery UI, load the, the CSS for jQuery UI, load our own script that will call the date picker, and then in Opera 11, which supports it, you just get the native one. And if not, we'll have to load a couple extra resources and get that one going on. That's the, that's the idea of it. Again, we don't know what browser you, our visitor is using. Let's accommodate. So what is a polyfill? A polyfill is a piece of code, says Remy Sharp, that provides technology that the developer expects the browser to provide natively. So you write in the fancy new proper way, and then it deals with the problems in the back. Paul says it in a few less words. A shim that mimics a present API with a fallback functionality for older browsers. Again, use the modern stuff and let the fallback happen, or regressive enhancement is the most terse way to say that. Uh, I wanted to mention these together because the, like, the kind of people that talk about modernizer are usually the same kind of people that talk about polyfills, and you're like, it's a little confusing because doesn't a, a polyfill does feature testing and modernizer does feature testing. So if you use modernizer to do the test and then load a polyfill, it's like it's, you're doing that feature test twice, which is a little weird. Some things usually don't do that. Either just use the polyfill or strip the, the testing thing out of the polyfill. <laughs> So where do you find these? So we looked at a polyfill earlier, the audio one that would provide the flash thing. How do you find the best ones? What are the best ones? Just go to HTML5, 
please.com, and it will just tell you, which is awesome. So, okay, we're trying to accommodate for all these older browsers, right? And, uh, in situations like, <clears throat> you just you need to test it, right? I want to deal with IE7. I need to look at IE7. How do we do that these days? We used to like boot into Windows and fire up the things, or we used to use tools like Adobe had some stuff. There's like br quick browser supershops.com that will give you static images of what the, your website looks like in all the browsers, but that's static and that sucks. I just wanted to point out this really nice resource called browserstack.com, which literally, you know, you, t you type in the thing you're on, you pick the platform and the version that you want to run, and it's not just Windows. It's like mobile devices, Windows stuff, Mac stuff, anything, and it will give you, within your browser, a live version of that website that you can play with. And, it, and they inject all the cool stuff that you need. Like if you're an IE7, it puts Firebug Lite in there, so you can live interact with your website in IE7 with Firebug through your browser with no VM stuff, right? It's pretty rad. That's just woof -woo loaded in IE7 on there, so you can do testing and stuff. Okay, we don't know what browser our visitor is using. We're trying to accommodate for those unknown. Screen sizes is kind of a big deal, right? Back in the day, school CRT thing, 640 by 480. They kept getting a little bit bigger in the kind of laptop zone. Laptops keep getting bigger. We got HD stuff. The new iPad is something like that. <laughs> crazy. Tons of pixels on there. This is the stats from CSS Tricks. It's just a bicycle wheel of different sizes. No one dominant size. You know, screens are just all over the place these days. And on the big screens, we know that people don't usually browse maximize, so that's weird. I did this research at CSS Tricks where I was measuring screen width and then browser width and got to all this data. I'll have links to slides and stuff. Found all this data that like almost nobody on larger monitors browses full width. They keep it much more small. This is a slide from Brad Frost. He's like, the web is not on any particular size anymore. I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. Just kind of like, there's no number. You can't, people just used to just crave what, the, what width should I make my website? They just had to know. It was like this vital thing before they could even put one pixel on Photoshop. They just had to know what size. Uh, and it used to be like 960. Just That's a good one. And now you just can't do that anymore. It's getting pretty irresponsible at this point to just make just 960 and that's what you get. That's, <clears throat> I just want you to think about, I, I don't want to make this whole responsive design session, but just think, just know that your website can be loaded on screens of different sizes. So just think about it. Do you need to do anything at all? I mean, some browsers have pinchy, zoomy stuff, and it's, you might not need to do anything. Maybe it's fine. Maybe you should look at responsive design and figuring out that. Maybe you should. How does your, how's the media working? Do you have, are your websites really heavy? Is there some way that you could serve smaller files? Maybe you should think about m.yoursite.bs or whatever. Maybe that's the right way for you. I don't know. Just be, you should consider it is the point because you don't know. You know. There's so many devices browsing the web these days. Just put some thought into it. This is a shameless plug for a project I worked on. Resizing images in fluid environments isn't so hard, right? You put max width 100%, height auto important, and it's just kind of, they keep their aspect ratio images naturally for whatever reason on the web. Videos don't because they're often in iframes or flash and stuff. So when you resize, you can like, get their width to switch, but then the video gets and you get the crazy black bars and stuff. Video isn't as easy to resize on the web. This is a plugin, a jQuery plugin that I wrote with uh, my Shop Talk co-host, uh, Dave Rupert, which just, I, uh, YouTube, Vimeo, all the popular ones, you just, you just put it on your page and then in, in fluid environments, it resizes videos and keeps their aspect ratio. Okay, browser, we don't know. Let's talk about dude. We don't know, dude. <coughs> it could be a dudette. I don't know. It could be some married dudettes. It could be the pizza dude. It could be one of these girls that like to look into. I bought a vector pack of images. <laughs> Use them all. Use everyone. <laughs> Where is the time situation? Where does he live? Okay, this is awesome. This website for this coin laundry place. I'm like, I want to find that. Looks like crap, by the way. But of course, it looks like crap anyway. I wanted to uh, find a coin laundry place. So here's this coin laundry place. Man, they care about me. They have big washers. Look at all this stuff. This is a great. It's honestly pretty close to what I'm looking for in a coin laundry website anyway. You know, like I can't. <laughs> looks authentic. 
But here's one thing that it's missing. Where the f*** is it? Where is it? That's the only thing that matters on a, on a site like this. That's it. I, all I want to know is where it is. And it's not on here. There's nowhere on here does it say where Sparkling Coin Laundry is. Let's redesign it. <clears throat> Name on the top. Pretty good. Pretty good. Where it is. Let's just stop. That's already better than where it was. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. But we can do more. We're going to put a map. Even better. We're going to say when they're open. That's cool. Uh, maybe a phone number. Maybe if they have one. Then if you have to at the bottom, you can... We're, ooh, we care about stuff. Maybe some navigation. Throw that on there. That way it's the alien eggs. That way you know it's real. That's for authenticity. So people are... <laughs> So we did it. We nailed it. But let's take this step further. With Remember Old Navy and the cool thing they did with geolocation? You can toss that on there. It's not above the, the skills of a coin laundry developer. You could geolocate, find if they're more than 50 miles away or 30 or whatever is practical, and just be like, dude, you're far away. Maybe you should do another search and link them up. <laughs> or you could be like, you're right here. How about a link to Google Maps with directions to get there? Go the extra mile. That wouldn't be that hard to write. Uh, and then you know what time zone they're in because they're close to you, so you can be like, we're open for only two more hours. Wow, that's, hey, thanks. Nice. All right, what is dude thinking about? We're talking about we don't know who this person is. We're trying to accommodate whatever. He could be bored. He could be in a hurry. He could be angry. He could be in a good mood. People browse the web in a bad mood all the time. You should probably consider that and make sure the website can... He could be feeling social. He could be doing some research, should be controlling, looking to buy something right now, or he could, maybe if you did a good job, he might buy something. He could be currently spooning somebody. No <laughs> idea. Could be anything. You could do a little user research. This is a Mac app that like records the person's face and what they're doing on the screen. This is just, I'm just giving some ideas to try to try to learn about the people that use your website. This, you'd have to like know the person because you do it at a computer, but uh, there's this other one that we've used at, at uh, SurveyMonkey for a minute um, that like tracks where they click and what they do and stuff. We're trying to learn about user behavior. That was a tool that might help that. Or you could just make good guesses, just ship it, you know, do some internal iteration with yourself and just use your experience as a designer. And then when you get feedback, you know, don't ignore it. Kind of think about it and use it. I'm just, we're trying to accommodate people here. So what, is, what does dude speak? At Wufu, this is our English version. We just recently launched a Spanish version of Wufu. Uh, at some point, it kind of makes sense to do this as a web app because there's just all these people that will use your website if it's in their language and won't otherwise, right? So it's kind of a, it's not a freebie because it was no trivial effort to, to get to this spot, but, uh, you know, we're accommodating unknown people here now. Pretty cool. So this is SurveyMonkey in Japanese. Uh, we use this tool called SmartLink to do it, which kind of like, it's kind of cool. You don't have to like fork your code base and have one with all the strings and stuff in one language and one in the other, keeping you having to maintain two versions of your site, which would kind of suck. SmartLink does some kind of DNS fancy where it like intercepts the request and changes out the stuff that it needs just to change out with the different strings and serves that. So you like keep this one code base, but it can serve it in different languages. And it doesn't do it automatically. We use real human translated stuff. All right. I hope we're doing okay on time. So the, the space between a browser and the dude is how dude interacts. He might not even have fingers. <clears throat> Does he have any disabilities? So maybe use a screen reader. That's one we talk about a lot in web design. If they are using a screen reader, are there links to get them places on the page that make sense? Are there, uh, have you tested the stuff that comes into your page with, with, with Ajax? Is that still findable by these people? Have you, like, like say you click something and it shows a contextual menu. Did you insert that next to where the button was so that the next thing that they can tab to is that? Or did you, like, put it on the bottom of the body, body where it would be hard to get to? <laughs> Tables for layout socks, because it's, think about that stuff. The end here is like, we're going to, go a little faster through the end, but I'm just saying, we don't know. Maybe the, here's one. Should we think about how computer savvy they are? Should we have different versions of our site? I'm saying no, no to that one. Uh, good interfaces should work, should work for anybody, right? You, you shouldn't think like, oh, this, this guy's good. The people, my, my users are good at computers, so I'm going to make everything tinier. That's not, I wouldn't factor that one in. 
Uh, and then thinking about devices, this is a big one these days, right? On a, on, a, on a laptop, we can click. We have contextual menus, so we can right-click. We can click and drag things. We can double-click. We have these things that you kind of can't do on a We have a keyboard, so we can press Command-S and maybe capture that in JavaScript and do something. You don't have any of that stuff on, on touch devices, but there's, then there's things on touch devices that we don't have on the web, too, right? So you would never bury something these days. You'd never have a menu that is required to be hovered over in order to expand necessary functionality. Those days are over, right? Because you can't hover anything on a tablet device. So don't worry about hover. There's just things like that you should think about these days, which I'm sure most of you are. But if you're not, you should be. One is the internet. We don't know how fast that browser connects to the, you know? So some people have really fast internet, some people have slow. This is, so the green bars is internet speed, right? So on the left, 50 megabits per second, download six megabytes, which is more comfortable size, in one second. Whereas with one megabit per second, it takes you eight seconds to get one megabyte. Super dramatic. Differences in speed, I did this poll with like 10,000 some voters on CSS Tricks, and, and they were all across the board. Just completely spread across all of those sizes, from extremely fast all through the middle to super slow. So it's, what do we do about that? That's a sucky unknown. Well, it, you, there's only one thing. You, we don't have to fork or do anything special for different people because there's only one goal at all times. And this is a funny one, too, especially in the web apps world because people don't ask you to do that. You know, if you get, you're like, tell me what you think about my new app design. They'll be like, cool, but there's not enough buttons or whatever, that, whatever they say. But they'll never say, make it faster. But you should, you should, <laughs> obviously. Uh, so make it fast for the people that have slow internet, and then it's, the side effect is it's super fast for other people. So here's, here's how you make it fast as a front-end person. Back-end people, a little more complicated, not my bag. Uh, but it's pretty easy on the front end, at least fundamentally, right? Use sprites, which are multiple images within one image, which reduces the number of requests that have to go across the network. That's just ridiculous, the speed savings you can get if you start taking spriting really seriously. Uh, in the same vein of reducing your request, concatenate your CSS uh, down to I ideally two per page, so a, a global style sheet that affects everything on your site and then something more specific to the page you're on, and minify so that small files do the same thing for your JavaScript if you can. Optimize your images, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, and load only what you need. Let's say if, you know you have this page that like get your core functionality on there, and if you need to add more, add it later. Basically, those five things are the fundamental rules of making a website kind of faster. Here's an example that I'd like to just call out because it was so ridiculous. Is that South by Southwest? If you go up to the browser menu and go file, save, you get all the resources. You know, you get this like web archive thing that has all the images in there. I grabbed that folder and drove, uh, checked out the images folder on there. There's 1.7 megabytes worth of images on SouthbySouthwest.com. I took that folder and I dragged it onto CodeKit and went under the images tag tab, which, so remember that cool software I was showing you earlier, select all the images and then just press optimize. And it'll go boop, and it saved 40%, it cuts 700K of images off there, and it does it losslessly, so you won't even be able to tell, right? It just cuts down the image size of that thing. So do that on your website when you get home. Grab code kid, grab all the images on your entire website, every one of them, drop them in here, put the button, and put them back, and it'll just speed up your website just for free, for nothing. So 700K we saved on that. Just Ridiculous speed savings and kind of irresponsible for websites to not be doing that these days, if you ask me. So once you've done all of that stuff, concatenated, you optimized the images, you sprited and stuff, then it's okay to have these, the, the, like the silly conversations that we like to have about, you used a descendant selector in CSS, don't you know that's slower? <laughs> That person for sure hasn't optimized the images on their website. You know, they like to are <laughs> guaranteed. And like this is stuff with redraws and squeezing scraps out of JavaScript performance. They'll be like, you don't need jQuery for that. You should write that in raw JavaScript. You're like, it's 31K. We just saved 700K on one website. And you're whining about jQuery? Dude. <clears throat> okay, so we don't know how the browser connects to the internet. If you're on a mobile device, generally, you, I mean, you could be sitting on your couch, but probably it has slower bandwidth. Certainly, like here at Minibar, they do. Uh, there's less caching on your phone, so page to page is like, so it's kind of a bigger deal. You're like, oh, we, it's a big page load at first, but on desktop it gets faster. Well, it doesn't on mobile. Uh, they have less processing speed. There's less memory on it. Just think about that stuff. You know, it's, it's, we're, it's an unknown world. So we're going to put a bird on it and say. We don't know. 
what the browser is. So let's use tools to deal with these unknowns, ease some of the pains for us. Uh, we don't know about the person, so try to accommodate any kind of person. Uh, we don't know, you know about uh, uh, their disabilities and stuff, so let's stick with that. We don't know about speed, so let's make it fast. I'll tweet the slides later. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.